It's been uh, lunch. We all, we all feel lunch. We've had a beautiful morning, quite contradictory lectures, I would say. They have, on one hand, taken the big picture, which Rem Kolos very politically put it. On the other hand, we've moved into the details of things and really looked at what architecture can be in the smallest attempt of precision. Now, I'm going to shoot somewhere in between and try to collaborate a little further on some of the things that I think could be a driver for the future profession. As we know, change of climate can be so many things. And obviously, they all relate to each other in one way or another. My attempt is going to be to look at the climate of change in collaborative models based on our own experience and how our practice is trying to open up and trying to look at one of the most essential elements I still believe being part of our profession, namely creativity. Now, we have, over a period of years, been working on a book called Idea Works. Uh, this Idea Works book is a collaboration between lawyers, bankers, architects, engineers, and NGOs, looking at the possibility of similar processes within any type of profession, almost like a generic way of defining what creativity could be, but of course, not encapsulating all of it at the same time. So since then, we've been looking for what we call the generic drivers at Snöhetta. What do we in a collaborative model do when we are at our best? How do we connect with others for us to be able to move? From this point of view, my first hypothesis will be that creativity is distinctive. Now, distinctive in the sense, and I'm not sure if I should say Pascal said this or somebody else, but distinctive in the sense that, quote, if I had more time, this letter would be much shorter. Now, that means distinctive in a sense that you don't lose the underlying complexities of anything. We're not talking about populistic simplifications. We're talking about densifications of certain ways of thinking and certain ways of moving forward. Almost as distinctive as the genetic fact within these reindeer that are 20,000 years old, like in one generation. So they adapt themselves, as we will see later, to their surroundings and their genetic profile is distinctive. So that means it's boiled down almost to the impression of an animal. But that animal is a distinctive simplification of itself. So from that point of view, this simplification, density of creativity, is where we would like to move the profession in the future. The collaborative models that we're seeing amongst many young officers and practices around the world is a clear indicator that the masters of architecture are gone, ladies and gentlemen. We can only rely on collaborative working methods. We've developed one method, which we call transpositioning, in short, trancing, which again means that you move from one position to another professionally during creative work. It could be compared to orchestras that change instruments when they are rehearsing a piece of music. This rehearsal attitude makes the trumpet player understand what the violinist is feeling when he plays the violin. It makes the violinist player understand what the trump trumpet player is doing when he's playing the trumpet. And when you swap all the instruments, you have chaos. 
during rehearsal, but at least it's brought all of these people closer together. Transpositioning means I'm not the architect when I sit around the creative table. Somebody else is the architect. And then maybe the landscape architect is the artist. The artist is the sociologist. The sociologist is maybe the engineer. The engineer is maybe the philosopher while you create. Why do we do this? Because most of us are carrying too many bad experiences within us. We're saying, cannot be done, been tried before, cannot be done. What happens when you pull away from this negative experience and you say, now is not then. You've never tried it now. And then you move from one position to another, swapping professions like a game, and all of a sudden you become a singular in the plural. You reflect yourself through the group that you're working within because you're getting the engineer for free in any case. He's been studying engineering. But what you're getting is the po poet inside the engineer when you transposition yourself. So the singular in the plural is a simple way of looking at how will we in the future look at collaborative models with a transpositioning effect. Now, what is the main driver in this singular in the plural effect? It is, of course, people. Architecture does not exist at any scale, at any rate, without people. It is based on a humanistic tradition, unlike art, and is only and only has meaning from that moment when it is reacting upon its users, upon its user groups, upon the people actually inhabiting the space, looking at it, feeling something about it, smelling it. So people are the most important driver for what we are supposed to do in architecture in the future, even in the teams that you create in your own practice. If you want to convince a client about something, you better make sure that you're doing that at home before you start convincing the client. That means you have to tidy up at home. You have to make sure that the processes that you're running with people have the same meaning when you transfer that to your possible client, to your possible collaborator. Now, how could that possibly look? If you think of the cylinder that you see here as a conditional cylinder, which describes the edge of how you collaborate, every little sphere is a person, and you move in time towards a possible common goal. You will see that every person moves freely within the boundaries he has, being given by the task, by the context. And the one person that really misses is the ball all the way up to the left. Why did he miss, or she? Because they went straight for the goal. I'll play it again. What happens when you go straight for a goal that is dynamic, which is in itself already moving? That makes you dependent on the group of people that you're actually working with because one is bound to be closer to the possible goal you're looking for than some of the others. And that has a magnetic attraction into creative work. If you think that that cannot be done physically, but only mentally, you're wrong. This is a plan, a possible plan of our office space. And people are located and situated singularly in a large space. Of course, no office spaces. And in a normal way, they would organize that type of workspace in formalized ways of communication. You would maybe seat one project together. You might want to seat one type of profession together. Or you might want to seat uh, sort of more undergroups that are interested in the same thing together. No, you split everything. You split the professions, you split the projects, 
and you distribute completely differently within the space, so you actually generate a totally new dynamic flow of information where also the possibility of coincidence comes into play. So this then, in the end, becomes our organizational diagram. That's how we sit, that's how we think, and that's how we are creative at our best. And that's how it looks. It looks like a mess, obviously. But it is like a newspaper production line. There's always something new coming in, and there's always something existing, and you are at many different levels when it comes to producing architecture. So the location of these type of things are important. We change every second year, then we tidy up a little bit, and then it gets untidy again. We do that in extended versions into exhibitions, like this one at the Danish Architectural Center last summer. Large group of workshops, simply with people that are interested in what we do, on a singular and on a plural basis. They can be smaller groups of workshops that have set specific themes of things they might be interested in, not even related to whether you have a client or not. They could be discussions, like here for the World Trade Center, while you're designing, and as we'll get back to describing this, all to do with negotiation. So it's this hands-on kind of way of interpreting workshop mythology that actually becomes collectiveness. Nobody owns architectural ideas. They are too complex for one person to own, so they grow. They grow like games. You say A, and then there is B, and then there is C, and D, and E. And when you're through the alphabet, you might have a project. We invite the clients even in to physically build models with us during the workshop. We send them in to the physical workshop where they have to cut wood. We let them come with their ideas, and one of the good things is that this type of collaborative model also brings them into the loop of a possible future ownership of the content of the project. That's how we deal with the clients. But people are much more. They are the dynamic element of architecture. Architecture, most of the time, is standing still. And as we know, we describe ourselves through where we are located in the world. Our eyes are always where our horizon is. If I'm 200 meters up, the horizon is with me 200 meters up. So when you take people into account as groups or as individuals, then all of a sudden they become part of the architecture. Or rather, the architecture becomes part of them. And from that point, all of a sudden, people are more important than the building within the building itself. Simple example of public ownership was for our library in Alexandria, where during the spring revolution, the public and the students of the library in Alexandria formed a ring, handheld ring around the building 24 hours a day to protect it against hooliganism and vandalism during the Arabic Spring. Now, why would they do that? Because it belonged to them. There is nothing as strong as the feeling of ownership. Right now, this bottle is mine. I know it's not mine but it's mine, because I'm close to it. I'm holding it in my hand. I can walk on this floor, it's my floor. Intimacy in architecture is a reason to be able to create public ownership. We did another experiment just to show you that age can actually be a specialization. We interviewed four people over 100 years old, north of the polar circle, about their relationship to the Nordic light, for a book for a lighting company called Sumtober. Now, what was this book about? It was about us understanding what these four 100-year-old people were thinking about, the development of light 
and indoor lighting from before electricity and up until today. Their capacity, as over 105, some of them, five years old, that's the last generation who can actually tell you about these stories and these things face to face. It is a specialization which can only be transferred by people. We had them photographed by fashion photographers. We scanned their heads and we had a big exhibition in Berlin and these four had never been out of their hometowns north of the polar circle. Interestingly enough, there was a big study done on sensitivity of color north of the polar circle. North of the polar circle, the tendencies that people have more sensitivity towards blue. They can read more shades of blue than as you move towards the equator. The same with these people. So after people, you have process. And process is where the drivers come in. These generic drivers that I was talking about, they become not like a method, and you don't have to tick them off, and if you don't do one of them, it won't work. No, they're kind of guidelines for things that we know when we've been looking for our drivers, they're guidelines that we know work when we perform at our best. We can almost like see throughout projects where we've left out certain elements of these drivers in a collaborative model, where we've lost the quality of the architecture that we're doing. The first one is zooming. Zooming means perspective, means Rem Kohlhaas, means taking a distance, means being political and understanding where you are at that particular point in time. But it also means zooming out in relationship to the place where you are and how you react to the context of that place where you are. And you can zoom in. As we know, scales change as you zoom in. Not only the representation of the object and the way it appears to the public passers, uh, passing by or to people looking at it, but it actually physically changes in size as you start zooming in. All the way to the detailed elements of a stone carved wall, or all the way down to the last smallest screw of a piece of furniture within the same building. So all of a sudden you have this enormous specter that comes from looking at it from the outer bay of Alexandria and all the way in down to the smallest lamp and door handle inside. And that's how you zoom in and out because these things with all the specialists involved in, uh, in order to achieve that have to collaborate. That's how you maintain the overview. It could also be, uh, Herzog and Demeron won this competition, so I shouldn't show it, but, but it's the, uh, it's the uh, Museum M Plus in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm showing it because framing goes both ways. Framing is not a way of looking at something from the outside towards the inside and the way you zoom, but it's creating reference systems for how things are actually being perceived. Now, it's very simple. A very simple mythology, but it still works. It still works in the sense that you can create specific spaces that are directly related to where you are when you look at the things you're looking at as a user or as an architect. This, by the way, is kind of the smallest museum that we've done. It's a museum for one photograph and it's what we call a ready-made piece of architecture. It's just a culvert, really, with some drilled holes in the roof. But framing can also be imaginary. We just developed a profile for the Norwegian national parks. So it's all about creating these reference systems together with others. What would this reference system be without zooming it in and out? Same frame, all the way down to the logo of the jacket. So all of a sudden, scale is part of what you deal with when you deal with zooming. Generative resistance is another driver. It's fantastic, especially today. 
And I have to mention this first. Of course, of all sustainabilities, social sustainability is the mother of all sustainabilities. Social, without social sustainability, there is really no possibility of developing environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, or even to some extent without becoming conservative cultural sustainability. Architecture has inherently a conservative side. It's so slow. There are so many forces working against architecture continuously, although we are privileged because we're not designing for ourselves, we're designing for others. And in this mass, we have to find for the future profession another way of getting the content of what we're doing right and in fighting against people who don't want to accept the climate change, we're struggling. Quite honestly, we're struggling. But it is a generative resistance in there, which means you mobilize even more. You want to achieve even more simply by the fact that there are some idiots who actually don't understand the seriousness of the matter. So right now, we're trying to develop quite some few of these projects, which are CO2 negative buildings, and I'll get back to that later. And uh, Bjarke is doing this one in Paris. But just to say, that's also a generative resistance kind of situation. Just simply by suggesting that farmland should be reused as farmland becomes such an enormously distant perspective for many people investing that it's hard to say that it would have come as an idea had there not been people saying it is impossible. We calculated it all the way through from construction to harvesting potatoes twice instead of once, all the heat gain, all the acoustics, everything in there. So here you see a typical farm size outside of Paris. You see the farm down to the right, and you see the new farmland covering one million square meters of buildings, which is approximately the size of an average French farm. But it could also be one family houses where you test out things and where the industry itself is working against you, saying, don't combine this system with this system because it won't work. So we have to build examples. And they are in themselves experimental. But gener re generative resistance can also be choosing different paths. In Guatemala City, by the mayor, we were asked, um, what kind of project would you like to design here? And we said we would like to design benches. Because the lady is sitting on the sidewalk selling tomatoes were getting more and more blocked by cars parking on the sidewalk. So we just created 300 benches which we located in front of the sidewalk so they could still sell their tomatoes. And too often today have I heard, not only today, but the last few years, that bottom-up projects and top-down projects are contradictory to each other, which is not true. Because most projects contain both top-down and bottom-up processes at the same time. And as architects, we have to master them both. We worked with a series of Guatemalan uh, artists, and now the benches are out there protecting the sidewalks. Liberating laughter. You might think, and I had this discussion yesterday about the Kunsthaus Graz, uh, is it a joke or is it humoristic? There's a slight difference. But liberating laughter is important for the group feeling, for the team itself. If you don't laugh at yourself or in the process that you're in the middle of, you're losing out on the best times of your life. You have to let it go. You have to laugh. In any situation, in any position, let it go. But of course, another driver which is important is to be curious. Now this was our first test, trying to generate a cladding for the Ground Zero Memorial Pavilion. We were looking for a window light opening that would generate 
two realities at the same time. So simply through the prism effect, the car that you see to the right is the same as the car to the left, and you see two cars at the same time because of the prism. Which one of them is real? Now, of course, that became a little difficult for the Ground Zero Memorial Pavilion, uh, but it did have an effect because you could locate the prisms in directions of different types of light and actually take down the green from the trees, the blue from the sky, the gray from the asphalt, and mix these colors inside the building. So it became a reaction to a double-sided reality. Or it could be like Pay White, the artist doing or has done our stage curtain of the Opera House in Oslo, which is a completely flat curtain, just woven, no silver threads, just colors, completely flat. Or it could be the Jazz Pavilion in Kongsberg, which has only one way of looking at itself, and that is throwing some sound down where the beer tents are lo located a little bit further down from the actual orchestras. The curiosity is a driver. Never stop being curious with others. To us, it's been extraordinarily important to go in the direction of rapid prototyping. Rapid prototyping is something that is much faster than architecture as such. You can translate very fast in workshops. You can understand what you're doing and where you're going. It doesn't mean you move away from the actual crafting of the architecture. It just means that you're testing while you're developing the things you are. Can we have a little bit of sound? Prototyping is loud. I need you to hear this. It is important. Now, a lot of people say 3D CNC carving, for instance, is a problem because it's removing the professionalism that is related to woodwork. No, it doesn't. Because you still have to choose and treat the wood correctly. Or the steel prototyping in large workshop spaces, or facades, one-to-one -one cast, like here for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. You're testing while you're going. Another driver, which we use a lot, is getting physical. Getting physical is uh, a lot about walking, in our case. We bring the Snohetta people from around the world, New York, Oslo, Innsbruck, Singapore, Adelaide, Australia, Stockholm, up to the mountain of Snohetta every year. Just to remind them uh, of one single very important sentence, which Laurie Anderson has used in one of her songs, which says, walking is preventing yourself from falling forward which means you're holding back. You understand how gravity works. You understand what it means to put a foot in front of the other. You know what it means to look at where you're going. You know what it means to look up to the sky and dream. And you know what it means to look back and see where you came from. And before you master all these four positions of the eye and of the head and of the body, you cannot walk. Walking is not only about the knee. But it's also a matter of getting physical in the sense and the debates that we're having on computerization and digitalization of our profession. We define four different ways to look at the relationship between digital and analog. We have what we call analog-analog, everything you do with your hands. Then you have analog-digital, which is what you do with your hands, you scan it and you vectorize it in the computer. Then you have digital analog, what you do in the computer, that then gets 3D printed or CNC'd at the other end and becomes an object. The last one is digital digital. That's what never leaves the computer. And these things go back and forth in the way of dealing with physical aspects. Or it could be calligraphy. Just simple Arabic calligraphy by a fantastic calligrapher. 
and you will see that the movement as you come around with the width of that pen, that actually gives you what is called the farka. That turning point of that writing is called the farka. And that's what gives it three dimensions. Not like our stupid letters, which just become like a profile when you extend them. So that means you can define, through physical observation, actually 3D objects that then in themselves have a meaning. And I think these are the fascinations of how to look at things when you become physical about what you're doing. And, of course, in the end, it's socializing, physically socializing around the bonfire, getting the hot dogs warm. But it's also educating and educating craftsmen for the future. When we did the library in Alexandria, we with Johan Sannes, who's the artist of this wall. We're teaching the young Egyptians how to actually carve and take the stone out of the quarries. It was like a two-year two training period for 20 young Egyptians. And all of a sudden, their skills were brought to a level where they now can produce for others. It's a way of transforming these things that we're dealing with. So this little group led on and I actually managed to clad the building uh, stone wall of Alexandria Library with more than 600 signs uh, hand carved. It means physical means going all the way into the quarry. It means being where the action is. Being physical means actually walking through the Carrara quarry, looking at Michelangelo's La Fasciata quarry and understanding how the stone sits in the mountain before you can use it. Another driver is what we call knowledge-based intuition. Intuition, we talk about, we all know we have brain cells in our stomach. That was discovered only two years ago. We also know that we do have the mirror neuron, which gives us the possibility of copy, copying others or learning languages. But knowledge-based intuition is simply a way of being creative, not relying on the fact that anything, anything would come out of thin air. It needs to come from someone. We don't invent things, but we combine things into new inventions. When Italo Calvino wrote the book Invisible Cities, in the discussion between Kublai Khan and Marco Polo, they agree very much on the fact that the keystone of the Roman arch is our culture. If you remove the keystone out of the Roman arch, the bridge, the, the, the Roman arch will collapse. That's where all the forces are coming together. They all meet in the keystone. And as long as the keystone is intact, that arch will stay. You can shake the foundations of that Roman arch, which is our economy. As long as the pressure from one stone to the other is intact, the arch will stay. As long as you don't remove culture, it will stay. So we designed a building in Saudi Arabia trying to explain this principle of Italo Calvino to Aramco, the client, the oil company in Saudi Arabia, and saying, you don't, you cannot rely on the development of your country without developing your culture at the same time. So the smallest piece in the arch constellation is probably, or could easily be, the most important piece. So we designed a building with a keystone, which is the smallest of all the pebbles in that structure, and if you remove it, the building will collapse. But it could also be moving a stone from Norway to Berlin. A stone that weighs 160 tons, is 15 meters tall, 7 meters wide, 60 centimeters thick. We had to strengthen the bridges in Berlin in order to transport it. So what happens when you do that and you cannot rely on the fact that the stone will break? So it's a one-piece stone transported to Berlin 
and then becomes the facade of the Norwegian embassy within the Nordic embassies there. Typically, the Germans would not allow us to use this stone as a static uh, load-bearing element because they have their DIN norm. So we would have to bring the stone to breakage. And when it broke, you could measure how much load it would take. And then you would have to bring in another one and do the same because they were never the same. So the columns came. And that's, that's back to reindeer. Funnily enough, these reindeer, like I said, the genetic code of them is evident. We were surprised, very surprised, when we found that in the caves of Lascaux, which is the second to Altamira, I know you think that, but they're both very beautiful. <coughs> the reindeer painted on these walls are the same genetic family as the ones that you see from Snöhetta and the reindeer pavilion. Now, this indication just tells you that the intuition when you design has a much larger spectrum of knowledge. And unless you know this, you can also not translate your knowledge into a creative design. One very important element is being generous, quite obviously, when it comes to the designs that you offer. I've been talking about public ownership, but it's also about space. This was a competition we won in 1989, and it was the first large-scale library which didn't separate itself into many rooms, but was generated as one space over seven terraces. It's like the opera house. You can be alone. You can go and put your feet into the water. You can come water skiing there. You can come paddling there. Or you can feed the swans. The generosity is about giving space. Generosity is about allowing people to react the way they want when they see what they have. Being generous is about following, again, some sort of way of believing that the water belongs to everyone, or at least the coastline belongs to everyone. And when you create that coastline, then you give it back to the public and you don't put up fences. Or it could be restructuring the whole central space of New York, Times Square, 40 million people visiting it a year. And just simply removing all the cars, leaving the taxis and the buses, and all of a sudden you have a new space. A space that can be used differently. A space that indicates, simply by getting rid of the cars at that particular point in time, change activity. That's generousness. What is not so generous is that the police of chief, chief of police, actually dislikes these hustlers and the topless ladies coming from Brazil trying to make small money. So it goes to the point where they say, dig the whole damn thing up, and it's only just about finishing. So already before it's finished, it's generated a problem. That is not generous. This belongs to the city. If it doesn't happen there, it happens elsewhere. It hasn't generated any new activities, but crime's gone down tremendously. Local pollution has gone down tremendously. And it opens up for girls to young girls to have their birthday parties there, or for businessmen to take a new look at things. Same in Riyadh, where we're designing a metro station. Now, first of all, the new metro in Riyadh is, of course, the first possibility for women to actually travel independently from their chauffeurs. But secondly, it is a hidden way of generating a public plaza. And should there at any point in time be the necessity to gather people in larger groups, then actually the metro station has generated this possibility. This is the ultimate goal, quite obviously. 
But generousness can also be a series of accessible things. This little cabin is part of a series we call keyless structures, meaning structures without keys. Open 24 hours a day for visitors to come, stay overnight, get warm, get dry, or it can be the new design of the Norwegian money, which we've just finished with our graphic department, which is based on the wind speed. The 50 crowner, you can see pixelation is very short, so that's really very, very weak wind, all the way up to a thousand crowner. That's a full storm. So moving from here and exchanging analog value bits and pieces of money, they are coming next year. As you know, we don't have the euro. We still have the Norwegian crowners. And to sort of have the generosity in saying, OK, we do actually create a new design for money. Maybe it's the last generation of money. But still, we put the effort forward to actually try to generate something new and interpretive that tells you more about that cash bill which you have in your hand. Trusting presence is always totally important to us. If you can't trust where you are, then you will not be able to trust anywhere else. The skepticism that architecture has generated through the way people become arrogant when they look at their own position compared to others is kind of a scary position for the moment. We have four places in the office we believe very strongly in. One is the lunch table and the meeting table, which you see here. Then, of course, the coffee machine, the world's most important drug. Then you have the arena where we meet every Monday for what we call Monday traffic. That's where we talk about all the divorces and the new kids and the new employees. And that's where we talk. That's where we read the poems in the morning. And then you have the workshop with the big industrial robots, the hand crafting, and the way you work forward. Another driver which we've been thinking a lot about, and we're not quite sure if it is a driver yet, but we are using it for the time being, it's martial art. Now, martial art is a difficult one, because, as you know, in martial art, you take the forces that come against you, and you turn them back towards your enemy or whoever is attacking you, without using much strength yourself. So, in many ways, taking the advantage of the forces coming against you and trying to turn something back is an art. If it is exactly much luck, we don't know. But in the case of the Ground Zero Memorial Pavilion, it was obvious that these were things we had to use. It is a negotiated building. It's not a design building. It's negotiated between Muslims, uh, uh, Republicans, Democrats, Catholics, Protestants, firemen, uh, policemen, families of the deceased in any type of constellation. And the stakeholders, up to 60, 70, 80 in the room, pulling in different directions. Finally, we finished it, the building. Of course, the smallest of all the buildings on Ground Zero, as you will notice, being looked down upon from very big commercial buildings. What we did, though, and what we kept from the very first prismatic uh, way of looking at it is that we said this building needs to reflect now. It needs to be right now. It needs to reflect the surroundings in a way that you have the feeling it is part of the city in its absolute present condition. That's why it's reflecting the surroundings the way it is, whereas the pools are reflecting the past. And it could simply be trying to, again, Jorn Sanders, artist, creating the roof of the opera house with more than 30,000 pieces. Make them work. Make them work without 
losing your mind in the way you're working with it. So, in, in effect, these 30,000 stones then fit like a puzzle, and not one of them was cut on site, and there was no stone waste on site. So these are the forces against that's much large. We uh, do a lot of this, eat, love, and pray. Uh, it is important because we open the office for all employees to have their birthdays, their weddings, their confirmations. We organize parties. We have a great kitchen. And this is part of how, and we don't want to be Google. We just want to have a nice workspace atmosphere. We just want people to use that space. One of the biggest issues we have today is that spaces are not being used enough. That is not environmentally sound, not to use the space you have built. You can calculate occupancy per year, and then you can see how use of space is really important to environmental conditions. It is important to break the law. It is important to do things that are illegal. And sound, please. He's French, of course, but in the relationship between architecture, misuse, and breaking regulations, there is a certain leverage. Let's say the skaters on the opera roof would be thrown out every time they come and skate. All of a sudden, you would lose the impact of that building in its urban environment. Yes, it's not legal, but you have to let it be. So after people and process, the result is projects. It's the Opera House with all its artistic elements. It is the stone masons that actually go in and carve these one-piece stones that have been designed by the artists and the architects. It is Olaf Eliasson who actually does sort of the slow movement of light that you collaborate with into the spaces that you're designing. It is the natural light that changes slowly and how you reflect that thing that actually then turns it into a project. Again, the stage curtain of Pay White or an artist like Bernard Melgor who asks us to design, asked us to design his house to die in. He gave us this drawing. That's my house. That's how we interpreted it in three dimensions. And we burnt the house before he did. So that's coming up next year. Or it is the King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture. Like this mirage, 110,000 square meters of culture. With the first pebble idea that led to the content of these different elements. The keystone, the library, the tower, the auditorium, the great hall exhibition spaces. More importantly, it has the first public cinema in Saudi Arabia. And it only has one entrance for men and women coming into any of the functions. Now, the cladding of this building was kind of a big technical challenge to us. So we, through research, actually came to the conclusion that the line is the simplest description of a three-dimensional object. And if you do that continuously and just wrap it, it becomes 
a cladding. That also meant that we could give all the pebbles, all these different shapes, the same material. And we could actually make them part of one hand. And that particular one hand then was within the same family, obviously, but they were still individual, like fingerprints on your hand. Then we had to rebuild this little machine to actually precisely bend each of these pipes and to manage that with 360 kilometers of stainless steel pipes to have a continuous movement around all these buildings became quite a task. Prototyping, again, mock-ups, and then at some point the final result where we're now testing out water carriers within the pipes to drain the heat out of the building and recirculate it back into the environmental system of the building. And then the other material, rammed earth. The team of Martin Rauch from Austria who did this were a group of 15 people from Bangladesh. And Anna Heringer, who's been here before, now has this same trained group of people who did our rammed earth walls in Saudi Arabia in Bangladesh. It's a small world. And the Saudis were so negative towards trying to do rammed earth walls because it was par part of their history that they weren't really proud of. But it's a fantastic material. It changes with moisture. It attracts moisture, it gives away moisture. It is, of course, also in combination with the stainless steel. So in a way, you have this high-tech, low-tech combination of things that are all, all of a sudden embedded into the design of this project, or the way up to the library and the library itself. It's finishing this year. All the designs like you know, graphic profiles of things and books and pictures and photography and our wild reindeer pavilion, all with so many friends, so many professions, so many other people involved like the framing and then the digitalized interior, the testing on our own machines, then the real thing and back in. Or the Aesop shops that we're doing around the world, seven of them right now, sort of skin care products. Why would we care? Because they care. They teach us about architecture. The designers of Aesop teach us about architecture. Or a play tower for kids, indoor, for Swarovski. That came about through a huge workshop where one of the general managers of Swarovski said, so what about if we, what if we built a play tower instead of a horizontal playground? So we built a tower, which is as amusing for grown-ups as it is for kids. It's the as of moment and how that has evolved through the facade after the opening, how it's been perceived, all the way from being IKEA uh, uh, architecture to new settings of developments within the museum world. The location of the stairs, always in a position where you would choose the stair instead of the lift. In America, they really need to lose some weight. So it was applauded by the client and by the users. The light, the conditions. All the way down to this little cabin again. All the way to the interiors and how you actually use the axe to create the wooden pieces that you build it with. All the way down to the minimum of effort and to the maximum of knowledge or the Ryerson Library in Toronto, which actually is the only building on Google Street View where Google Street View goes all the way up through the building because it is an unprogrammed -pro building. It doesn't have a program. It's self-programmed by the students. 
as you come in up to the beach. And these kind of teaching situations are extremely interesting. We've been playing around lately, also with creating new languages, especially for a school in, in Oslo. So symbols and languages for this school, high school in Christiania. And just before the summer, we found out the students had started tattooing these symbols on their bodies. That wasn't the intention. But it's, it's, it's becoming tribal. And they recognize themselves as part of where they are having their education. And back to Lascaux. It's almost finished. The caves are replicas. They're copied one-to-one -one size. And they've been scanned from the inside down to a precision of 0 0.3 millimeters and been repainted by 20 artists over a period of more than two years. And now, after the scanning, we found deep engravings in the caves, part of paintings that the researchers had not discovered before we started copying it. This is uh, current status, the bench. And before I end, I guess I have five minutes still. Before I end, I'll just say something about this powerhouse situation where we find the collaboration between so many professions to be of extreme importance. And that's finding environmentally green solutions to buildings. We have a constellation which we call the powerhouse, which is the developer, which is the client, which is the engineer, which is uh, the uh, zero group, which is an NGO environmental institution. It's us as architects, all around the same table, working towards these things. So we have completed one building, which is fully CO2 negative. CO2 negative means that you take the embodied energy of the total construction of the building. You know how much energy has gone into the smallest screw, into the foundations, the concrete, the food that the workers have taken in, their clothing, the transport, plus the consumption of energy in the building on a yearly basis, maintenance, cooling, and so forth. And you add these two CO2 equivalents which means you have to produce more clean energy than these two together. Only then you can subtract year after year to get a CO2 negative building. You do it with the envelope, again, burnt wood. You have displacement ventilation going through the core of the building and then distributing. So again, it's the stair that is the actual ventilation system. Everything that is used inside is re, uh, recycled materials, like all the white you see here are old plastic bottles. You use the geothermal uh, 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 energy, and you use the photovoltaic uh, production line. And all of a sudden, we have an energy balance of 14.3 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. That's where we have to get. The next step is to calculate recycling of the whole building and the CO2 equivalent through recycling of the things that we're building. This we're trying to do with the Le Monde project in Paris, their new headquarters, which has another social aspect to it. The day after Charlie Hebdo, I met with Pierre Baget, who is one of the owners, and he said, I know what happened but I still want an open, accessible media house. That was a way that we could definitely develop a building further with and see how that would fit and suit that particular security situation in Paris. But we've done very small studies. This is a small lampshade pavilion in Singapore simulating some of these Things. It is photovoltaic shading during day, 
which then only slows down the sunlight and gives it away just like from here to here uh, uh, at night. So it's like a delay of sunlight of about eight to nine hours. Or the Serpentine Pavilion, which Bjarke is doing this year. I did together with Olaf Eliasson many years ago, poets. The way we deal with these things is on an intimacy basis. It's based on the future of architecture, that we are sincere, that we work together, and that we really take advantage of our position as those who know. The smallest project we did so far is for 80,000 bees, 80,000 in each, producing 80 kilograms of honey each. So the smallest building, but for the largest number of inhabitants. This is a direction we are wanting to continue going in. Thank you very much.